man. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Page Turners Podcast. I am your host, Elgin Bailey. Where I come to you, I pick a book every season, and I walk through that book page by page, line by line, offering commentary, feedback, thoughts, book suggestions with the intent of providing you, the listeners, with the tools to be able to study and fight oppression of every form and fashion, right? So this particular season, we are doing uh, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded Beyond the Nonprofit Industrial Complex, a insightful book, a challenging book, but one I think is incredibly crucial for us in this particular moment in our lives where every social movement everything that is taking place anybody who is fighting anything is fighting something in regards to uh, any sort of injustice or problem folks are uh, starting nonprofits and running to nonprofits as the way to get things started and to get funding and all those things. Unfortunately, it's having a an effect on folks who believe in and see the importance and necessary uh, just the direction that we should be going when it comes to the fight for our lives is not going to happen via foundations and nonprofits and all those things. I think those things are crucial, can be crucial, and can be important. But they are also deeply problematic in a variety of capacities. Uh, I'm not talking about those grassroots organizations that, you know, start nonprofits as a way to support particular programs uh, while grassroots organizing whose books are open for everyone to see and take an account of who's donating, what foundations are supporting those particular organizations. Because oftentimes what you'll see is a lot of foundations are being supported by organizations and foundations that are directly in opposed to what you, the organization, are attempting to do. So that's where we are, man, and that's enough. I'm going to dig in to what we're building. And again, this is Elgin Bailey. We are reading the first essay of the Nonprofit Industrial Complex. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. We're reading the first essay within Beyond the Nonprofit Industrial Complex. A revolution will not be funded. Essay number one is written by the great Dylan Rodriguez, someone you should definitely check out for his other works, uh, particularly White Reconstruction that he just put out here recently. So, without further ado, let's dig in. If you're following along in your book, which is cool, if not, listen to the wonderful sounds of my voice as I read and explain and unpack and ask questions. Okay? We are in page 27, if you are following along. This particular essay is The Political Logic of the Nonprofit Industrial Complex. And I read, The self-narrative of multi-billionaire philanthropist George Soros, whom the PBS program now described as the only American citizen with his own foreign policy, brings candor and clarity to the societal mission of one well-known liberal philanthropist Funder, patron. When I had made more money than I needed, I decided to set up a foundation. I reflected on what it was really cared about. Having lived through both Nazi persecution 
and communist oppression, I came to the conclusion that what was paramount for me was an open society. So I called the foundation the Open Society Fund, and I defined its objectives as opening up closed societies, making open societies more viable, and promoting a critical mode of thinking. That was in 1979. By now, I have established a network of foundations that extend across more than 25 countries, not including China, where we shut down in 1989. Soros' conception of the open society, fueled by his avowed disdain for laissez-faire capitalism, communism, and Nazism, privileges political dissent that works firmly within the constraints of the bourgeoisie liberal democracy. Their imperative to protect and, in Soros's case, to selectively enable with funding dissenting political projects emerges from the presumption that existing social, cultural, political, and economic institutions are in some way perfectible and that such dissenting projects must not deviate from the unnamed values which serve as the ideological glue of civil society. Perhaps most important, the open society is premised on the idea that clashing political projects can and must be brought, forced, into a vague state of reconciliation with one another. Instead of there being a dichotomy between open and closed, I see the open society as occupying a middle ground where the rights of the individual are safeguarded, but where there are some shared values that hold society together, I envision the open society as a society open to improvement. We start with the recognition of our own fallibility, which extends not only to our mental constructs, but also to our institution. What is important can be improved by a process of trial and error. The open society not only allows this process, but actually encourages it by insisting on freedom of expression and protecting dissent. The open society offers a visit, vista of limitless progress. The open society merely provides a framework within which different views about social and political issues can be reconciled. It does not differ, offer, a firm view on societal goals, if it did, it would not be an open society. George Soros. Critically, the formulaic, naive vision of Soros' open society finds its condition of possibility in United Foundation purse strings as dissent flowers into viability on the strength of generous grant or two, the essential conservatism of Soros' manifesto obtains common sense status within the liberal progressive foundation industry by virtue of financial force. As his patronage reigns, hum this is crazy. Are you listening to this? Jeez. And I read, most important, the open society's narrative of reconciliation and societal perfection marginalizes radical forms of dissent which voice an irreconcilable antagonism to white supremacist patriarchy, neoliberalism, and racialized state violence and other structures of domination. Antonio Gramsci's present reflection on the formulation of homogenic state as simultaneously as organizational repressive and pedagogical apparatus is instructive. The state does not have and request consent, but it also educates this consent by means of the political and syndical association. These, however, are private organisms left to the private in initiative of the ruling class. It's wild. Certainly, the historical record demonstrates that Soros and other foundation grants have enabled a breathtaking number of left-of-center campaigns and projects in the past 20 years. The question I wish to introduce here, however, 
is whether this enabling also exerts a disciplinary or repressive form on contemporary social movement organizations while nurturing a particular ideological and structural allegiance to state authority that preempts political radicalism? Hell of a question right there. Social movement theorists John MacArthur, David Britt, and Mark Wolfson argue that the channeling mechanisms embodied by the nonprofit industrial industry may now far outweigh the effect of direct social control by states in explaining the structural infrastructure orthodox tactics and moderate goals of much collective action in modern America. That is, the overall bureaucracy, bear, man, I'm, I'm trying to calm down because this stuff is frustrating. That is the overall bureaucratic formality and hierarchical, frequently enlist elitist structuring of the NPIC has institutionalized more than just a series of hoops through which aspiring social change activists may jump. These institutional characteristics, in fact, dictate the political vistas of the nonprofit industrial complex organizations themselves. I'm going to read that again, okay? Very, very important. That is, the overall bureaucratic formality of hierarchical, frequently elitist, elitist structuring of the NPIC has institutionalized more than just a series of hoops through which aspiring social change activists must jump. These institutional characteristics, in fact, dictate the political vistas of the NPIC organizations themselves. The form of the U.S. left is inseparable from its political content. The most obvious element of this kinder, gentler, institutionalized repression is its bureaucratic incorporation of social change organizations into a tangle of incentives, such as postal privileges, tax-exempt status, quick access to philanthropic funding apparatuses made possible by state bestowal of the not-for-profit status increasingly. Avowed progressive radical leftists and even some self-declared revolutionary groups have found assimilation into this state-sanctioned organizational paradigm a practical route to institutionalization. Incorporation facilitates the establishment of a relatively stable financial and operational infrastructure while avoiding the transient messiness and possible legal complications of working under decentralized, informal, or underground auspices. Man! Ha! <sighs> Listen. The most obvious element of this kinder, gentler institutionalized repression is its bureaucratic incorporation of social change organizations into a tangle of incentives such as postal privileges, tax-exempt statuses, and quick access to philanthropic funding apparatuses made possible by state bestowal of not profit status. Here it is right here. Listen to this. Increasingly, Avowedly progressive radical leftists and even some self-declared revolutionary groups have found assimilation into this state-sanctioned organization paradigm a practical route to institutionalization. It, it, it leads to, it removes that progressive radical leftist, even revolutionary ideology and leads to institutionalization and that's worth a highlight I think and I read incorporation facilitates the establishment of a relatively stable financial and operational infrastructure it provides finances it provides the operational infrastructure to allow organizations to move 
That's the perception. And in many cases, that happens. But in a whole lot of cases, that ain't what the hell takes place. Right? Right? While avoiding the transient messiness and possible legal complications of working under decentralized, informal, or underground auspices. The emergence of this state proctored social movement industry suggests an historical movement away from direct, cruder forms of state repression towards more subtle forms of state social control of social movements. Hear that, hear that, hear that, hear that, hear that. The emergence of this state proctored social movement industry, the nonprofit industrial complex, state proctored social movement industry suggests an historical movement away from direct cruder forms of state repression towards more subtle forms of state social control of social movements. Indeed, the United States learned from its encounters with the crest of radical and revolutionary liberationist movements of the 1960s and early 1970s that endless spectacular exercises of military and police repression against activists of color on the domestic front could potentially provoke broader local global support for such struggles. It was in part because they were so dramatically subjected to violent and racist U.S. state repression that black, Native American, Puerto Rican, and other domestic liberationists were seen by significant sectors of the United States and international public as legitimate freedom fighters whose survival of the racist state pivoted on the mobilization of global political solidarity. On the other hand, the U.S. state has found in its coalition with the NPIC a far less spectacular and generally demilitarized and still highly effective apparatus of political discipline and repression that to this point has not provoked a significant critical mass of opposition or political outrage. And I read, Ooh, boy. The Internal Revenue Service, tax laws of individual states, the U.S. Postal Service, and the independent auditors help keep bureaucratic order within and the political lid on what many theorists refer to the post-1960s emergence of the new social movements. MacArthur, McCarthy, rather, Britt and Wolferson conclude that this historical development has rather sweeping consequences for the entirety of civil society. Another consequence of the growth of this system is a blurring of the boundaries between the state and society, between the civil and the political. Our analysis suggests that a decreasing proportion of local groups remain unpenetrated by the laws and regulations of the central state. Some analysts see civil space declining as a result of fusion of the private and political by the activists of the new social movements who politicize more and more civil structures in the pursuit of more comprehensive moral and political goals. Our analysis views the construction as more the consequences of state penetration of the civil land, the consequences in more traditional terms, a narrowing and taming of the potential for broad dissent. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Oh, man. I, the NPI, and I read, the NDI, N, boy, hold on. Let me step back just for a second. Okay. The NPIC that serves as the medium through which the state continues to exert a fundamental dominance over the political intercourse of the U.S. left, as well as the U.S. civil society more generally. 
even and especially as organizations linked to the NPIC assert their relative autonomy from and an independence of state influence, they remain fundamentally tethered to the state through extended structures of financial and political accountability. Jennifer Walsh, notion of a shadow state crystallized a symbiosis between the state and social change organizations, gesturing toward a broader conception of the state's disciplinary power and surveillance capacities. According to Walsh, the structural and political interaction between the state and the nonprofit industrial complex manifests as more than a relation of patronage, ideological repression, or institutional subordination. In excess of the expected organizational deference to state rules and regulations, social change groups are constituted by the operational paradigms of the conventional state institutions generating a reflection of state power in the same organizations that originally emerged to resist this very same state. In the United States, voluntary groups have gained resources and political clout by becoming a shadow state apparatus, but are increasingly subject to state-imposed regulations of their behavior to the extent that the shadow state is emerging in particular places, there are implications for how voluntary organizations operate. The increasing importance of state funding for many voluntary organizations have been accompanied by deepening penetration by the state into voluntary group organizations, management, and goals. We argue that the transformation of the voluntary sector into a shadow state apparatus could ultimately shadow, shackle, rather, not shadow, shackle its potential to create progressive social change. It handcuffs folks. It handcuffs folks. The MPIC has political epistemology, the co-optation of political imagination. I think this is actually a very good place to stop. I think this is a very good place to stop. I want to stop here as Dylan Rodriguez transitions to another portion of the essay titled The Nonprofit Industrial complex as a political epistemology, the co optation of political imagination. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the Page Turns Podcast with your host, Elgin Bailey. I really appreciate you guys continue to support what we're doing. Big huge shout out to Keystone Digital TV for all of their help and all of that as my phone.